Welcome back, Rock Raiders. I'm your host, R.R. Slugger, and today we're going to be talking about the minor minutia that makes being a fan of this series so rewarding, Rock Raiders canon. This video is not meant to lay down the law on the matter, as I have no authority in this department. Honestly, at this point, no one does, so canon is going to be what you make of it. We will go through the myriad of sources we can use for the lore, and things to consider when compiling our own headcanon. Rock Raiders, like many other LEGO themes at the time, had an original storyline featuring the characters and vehicles seen in the sets. The LEGO group has largely shied away from this in recent years, with only a few exceptions, but back in the 90s this was the norm for the toy company. Oftentimes, LEGO themes would have tie-in comics, standalone novels, and magazine featurettes in order to communicate the story ideas to potential fans or customers. Because LEGO products are released in a wide array of regions, localization efforts would frequently and understandably cause some inconsistencies to arise, ranging from characters having alternate names to story beats being muddled. Wading through a sea of conflicting details can be fascinating, but it is also easy to get lost in the particulars. Like many other themes, Rock Raiders has so many official sources of lore that one simply cannot consider them all to be canon, as they actively contradict one another. We will have to establish some landmark entries and work our way around that. As the term canon is often used to refer to details that are genuine or true to the original story, what exactly is the original story of Rock Raiders? Well, the general consensus online seems to be that the events of the PC game are to be considered canon of the highest tier. This makes a lot of sense to me, as the game was famously being developed alongside the toys, meaning that Rock Raiders had a unique genesis that led to one of the most authentic video games in LEGO's history. It's also a game that has nearly single-handedly kept interest in this theme alive, so using this as our primary source of lore seems to be the logical choice. Ergo, anything that contradicts the details of the PC game might be considered non-canon, though it's not as cut and dry as that. When using a video game as a source of canon, one must consider the separation between a genuine detail of lore and a gameplay mechanic. For example, is it really true that the LMS Explorer is incapable of teleporting a Tunnel Scout down to Planet U without having a support station in the vicinity first? How can you have missions with trapped miners when it seems like every individual is equipped with a personal teleporter? I would argue these are design decisions made for the purpose of enhancing gameplay and should not necessarily be taken at face value. This does, however, shine a spotlight on some of the issues we will encounter throughout this video, as not even our primary source of canon is airtight. This is perhaps tangential, but I do think it's relevant to discussion. How does early or cut content factor into canon? Some of the stuff is even contained on the disc with the rest of the game. Should scabby scavengers be considered canon? What about lurkers? Scorpions? We see those in the PlayStation game at least. Wait, is the PlayStation game even canon? Hopefully you can appreciate how many factors there are to consider when working with the extents of Rock Raiders lore. Beyond the video games, there were three standalone books for the series, one of which I have already featured on this channel. Starting with The Race for Survival, I consider this to be one of the strongest secondary sources of canon that's out there. Taking place after the events of the PC game, this story serves as a follow-up to the team's original adventure and doesn't rock the boat too much. That being said, now's about as good a time as any to bring this up. What is this item called? If you're familiar with Rock Raiders, I'd wager you said Energy Crystal. You're not wrong, but you might be surprised to know that outside of the PC game, nearly every other source of Rock Raiders lore calls them either Power Crystals or Briconium. Does our primary source of canon trump all, even when it is contradicted by nearly every other source? I don't have these answers, sorry, I just think these are important points to consider. 
Regarding the interactive puzzle storybook, I don't have a whole lot to say about this one. The narrative is rather light and seems to depict an alternate series of events after the asteroid struck the LMS Explorer. There is no mention of a wormhole, so it's possible this is just another zany adventure on an unrelated planet, but yeah. In contrast, the High Adventure Deep Underground graphic novel is the most non-canon thing that ever non-canoned. <laughs> this is a total reimagining of the source material, complete with liberal character redesigns and flying granite grinders. There are some welcome nods to other lore, such as the Rock Whale from the PlayStation game, but overall I don't hold this one in high regards. I've never liked the whole chief has never left the ship angle, as I feel this makes him come off as cowardly, which is unbecoming of the great Rock Raider's leader. This graphic novel doubles down on that by also giving him a plasma arm to fight off the monsters at the end with. This really rubs me the wrong way. Simeon Hankins of Data Design Interactive designed the character to have a prosthetic limb in the first place to help normalize this type of condition. By giving him superpowers, the creators of this graphic novel have effectively othered Chief again, and almost make you wonder why the other Rock Raiders don't follow suit with removing one of their limbs in favor of this wonderful plasma cannon. I don't know, maybe I'm being too harsh on this one. Maybe it's actually a thoughtful discussion on the nature of humanity and the moral compass and ethical fortitude required to navigate the quandaries of moving beyond the path of least resistance and embracing the richness and cogitation of post-social cyberneticism. And then I remember that they don't even get which arm is the prosthetic right half the time. One final aspect of Rock Raiders lore that I often see overlooked is the non-language kind. I'm referring to the small comic books that were included with the sets in certain regions. These days, they can be tough to track down. Not even Slugger has a complete collection. Nonetheless, I actually feel that these are some of the best little additions to the Rock Raiders canon. Sometimes they feature the mundane, sometimes they feature the fun, but there is always an intentional emphasis on construction, chaos, and reconstruction. One of the greatest hidden play features in any set from this era is the ease of rebuilding it after having some fun breaking it apart. With their highly detailed and all too intricate builds, I don't think you can make the same argument with most modern sets, unfortunately. As such, these comic books highlight what made Rock Raiders such a great LEGO theme to begin with, and are purely additive to the lore of the series, in my opinion. I sincerely hope that I've raised more questions with this video than I've answered. I don't want to become the arbiter of Rock Raiders canon, and that was never my intention behind this. If you've seen something in this episode that intrigues you, or have been introduced to another aspect of Rock Raiders lore you were unfamiliar with, I hope you take the time to track it down for yourself and indulge. Don't let my reduction of it here be your only source of information on the topic. As I said in the beginning, Rock Raiders canon is what you make of it, and I strongly believe that extends to other themes as well. The stories we create with our imagination are always more worthy than those written in a magazine. Thanks for watching, everyone. I've been your host, RR Slugger, and I hope to see you next time for some more high adventure, deep underground. Uh, not that one. No, no.